but there's probably about nine people which missed it. So I'm just going to summarize it. Basically, my passion, my forte is nutrition. And I fell into that by default. I was injured at a young age, couldn't really look the part which I wanted to deliver being a self-employed PT. And the only modality what I could control was nutrition. And by looking deeper into this, I was able to really speed and enhance and get full efficient recovery from my injuries. But then later on from that, I started to get injured elsewhere. And if I would have understood some of the concepts in traditional Chinese medicine, I could have preempted that and possibly prevented my injury. So this is really where I have developed the love for nutrition and the essentiality. Now with nutrition, it dictates the language of our cells and basically we're fucking made up of cells, right? So when we manipulate nutrition, it's the physiological prerequisite for our health and our health is a physiological prerequisite for our functionality, our performance and physique. So we really want to uh, pay attention to it and definitely uh, not overlook things. Now there's elements in terms of um, the whole calories in versus calories out world, both sides are right. Okay. And first of all, if we want to talk about concepts and stuff, there's no such thing as right or wrong. It's just a universal, a universal agreement. But in terms of um, there's some aspects of, OK, uh, if it fits your macros approach, may be best for some individuals. You know, it'll enable that freedom, that food diversity, their access to social events. Whereas other side of the fence, you know, looking at specific nutrients is going to be paramount in order to, the, to enable them to break through new stages. And it all depends on what clientele you're working with and what their goal is. So it has to be flexible, adaptable, and relative to that person. So please don't think I'm married to just you know, the nutrition side and micros is the be all and end all. Because when we look at health, if someone follows an if it fits your macros approach, drops body fat, and they get leaner, generally, most of their health biomarkers will improve, despite of their food quality. So their obesity is a definite governing factor of their health and their durability to the diet will dictate their body composition. So if someone finds it hard to stick to a diet because of certain niche foods or the specificity of foods, then that probably isn't the right thing for them. But I deal with a completely different type of clientele as to Rodin. Okay? So Rodin is the fucking man at getting people pros, getting people on stage, medals, that sort of thing. Whereas my clientele is the diseased, the deficient, the people which have hit these health roadblocks and they go to several different specialists, doctors, clinics, and they're not really getting anywhere. So it's different side of the spectrum, which is good, really, really valuable for you guys today, because some of you may be dealing with photo shoots, transformations, comp prep, whereas some of you may be dealing with people which have you know, just general health goals. You know, they want to feel good, they want to have a libido, they want to have good energy, they want to be able to sleep, they want to fix their bloating and generally feel healthy. And that's this side of the spectrum. So you know, the beauty of today is that you get to pick both our brains and we both um, just have slightly different approaches, but we agree on the same philosophies. So what I'd like you to do is to the person next to you, if there's an odd one out, which these two, so you two can partner together, front and back. Uh, I want you to screen your partner on the screen and form what you've just got access to. And I'm only going to give you around five minutes, so be fast. Don't start chatting. Right. If you've not finished, don't worry. I'll we'll talk through it and your chance to make notes. So guys, listen up. So. What you've just done there is basically assessed your partner or potential client, because we could reframe that, right, on many different visual cues to gain insight into the body. So normally when you do a consultation, you ask them about you know, what their goals, their health history, you know, what they want to do. But when we use this, this is gaining further insight into them as an individual which could help you either with your nutrition plans your training programs because let's say if you uh, did the pupil response test okay and this is where you close your eyes for 10 seconds and then when you open your eyes the pupils dilate slowly if they did it would show that your body has a high level of stress you know so that's just one tool but then we don't just want to rely on that one tool would cross correlate because it's not definitive it's just a correlation 
because then we could also look at the tongue. So if they hold out their tongue and it quivers and they can't hold it uh, still, again, it could be that they have high levels of stress. So if someone has a high level of stress, are you going to put them on a high volume program? Probably not, right? Because you can only train as hard as you can recover. So these are just tools which that's just a basic, basic way to give you insight into how you can use this to train, design the nutrition, and also lifestyle factors with the clients. But a very useful aspect of this is in the initial consultation. So if you can ask them these questions and understand how they are, what happens when you feel understand? You know, you communicate into, and someone really understands what you're trying to say. You build rapport, okay? And if this is your first time you're meeting this client and you understand them without them having to tell you, it's a good way to build trust and rapport. And from trust and rapport, you can build a durability and consistency. And then that's really the general power behind getting results. As Rodden says, you know, you can keep a program and as long as they adhere to it for a prolonged period of time, they'll get results. They don't need to change it all the time, it's just general pop. So if you can build that durability from gaining that trust, from showing you know them without them telling you, then you fucking sold them already. Yeah? So there's 62 visual feedback markers. And when you get good at this, you could probably do it in about 10 to 30 seconds by looking at the individual. Now, we have to remember that this is just the correlation. It's not to treat, diagnose, or cure. And if they do have any issues, illnesses, or diseases, you recommend them to go see a healthcare practitioner. Okay? You don't take that on yourself. So when we look, there's 12 different things what we can tell from the skin, 11 from the nails, 17 with the eyes, but I've deleted some just to make it a little bit more efficient today, four with the nose, five with the mouth, five with the tongue, and eight with the hair. So there's quite a lot what you can tell from the individual. And our, our bodies are beautiful, complex organisms. They send out these signals, which we often refer to as symptoms. But those symptoms give you insight into how your body's functioning. And that's what we're doing. We're just manipulating the function of the body to get a desired outcome. So from the questions what we went through just now, do any of you know what they mean in terms of insight to physiology? If so, put your hand up, we'll just go through it. Apart from Daz books, we've done a lot of stuff with this. Go on. I think I heard you on a podcast a while ago, the vertical bricks on the nails is to do the stomach acid. It's perfect, cool, yep. It can also correlate to zinc. Anyone else? Go on. Yeah, sure, just hit me up with some... Pardon? Yes, perfect. So. Behind the eyelid, if it's pale, that could be low iron. Good. So we already know some of the concepts, but we could possibly build on that. Right. So with the skin, if someone has any skin conditions like eczema or psoriasis, what could this mean? <coughs> Pardon? Possibly, yep. Yeah. Food intolerance is good. What else? Where does autoimmune disease stem from? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, largely it stems from the gut, right? What else? Stress. Stress. What does stress do to the gut? You have flight and fight mode, and then you have Rest and digest, perfect, well done. Okay, so when you're stressed, it impairs digestion. Impaired digestion will create digest digestive distress and that will possibly resonate with disturbances on the skin. A good way to think of it is the outer skin is a reflection to the inner skin's health, the inner skin being the intestines. Because if you had, fuck it, like, you know, Mr. Tickle, you know, Mr. Men, the, the children's thing, right? He's got a long ass fucking arm. Right? So if you went inside your mouth, down your throat, you could go all the way through the intestines and come out your ass. Right? It's not technically inside the body until it's absorbed into the body, and that's done so through the intestinal wall. Okay? So that's the inside of the outsides. Okay? So it's the inner skin. That's what they refer it to. So if you have any disruption to the inner skin's health, so the intestinal inflammation, gut disturbances, it can resonate with that of eczema 
or psoriasis. And it can also strongly correlate to food intolerances. And it could also correlate to issues with essential fatty acids or zinc. So this is when you say, for instance, your client comes to you and they have bad eczema. And they say, OK, I want, I want to drop fat. OK, you're like, brilliant. OK, great. And then you screen them on the, all these other things. And they didn't know that you could actually help them manage their eczema. And then they stop having the red skin or the flaky skin on their face. What's going to happen to their confidence? It's going to go up, right? And what's going to happen to you? They're going to really applaud you and put you on a pedestal in their own head, right? Okay, because you've done stuff what you, they didn't associate with what you were doing. And this is the beautiful thing with us as PTs or coaches, we have a great impact on our clients. We have a, a beautiful thing by improving health. We can really impact people in a way what they didn't initially associate with us. Okay, red tone to the skin. You were just speaking about five minutes ago, so I know you all got voices. So come on. What's that? High blood pressure? Perfect, that's one. What else? Inflammation, cool, systemic inflammation. Inflammation throughout the body. Yellow tinge to the skin. Pardon? Close, liver, good, yep, okay. So it's otherwise known as jaundice. Yellow spots under the eyes. Yes, same thing, good. Make sure you're making notes. Right, because you've got the screening form, make notes on this. I'll test you at the end, so if you don't know, I've presented you the answers, then you've clearly you've not made notes. If your skin is grey, weird one, that. Tough, okay. It's um, nice in deficiency, vitamin B3. Brown red tint on shins. I'll give you... Uh, a case study of how, where this is probably more likely to be apparent. If you have a, cl a client which is heavily obese, and you, when you're training them, you might see the scaly skin on the back of the neck, or the knees, or the shins, and it's got a brown or red tinge to it. What could that possibly be? Perfect, insulin resistance. So what happens when you're obese? you become pre-diabetic or potentially diabetic, you develop insulin resistance. What happens when you have insulin resistance? You have poor circulation. What happens when you have poor circulation? The extremities may start to die faster in terms of the skin, right? Red nodules on skin. So the, the um, technical term for this would be follicular hyperkeratosis. You might have seen it on the back of the tricep, you know, the red dots. Yeah. Does anyone know what that is? Could be low EFAs, low vitamin A, low vitamin E, or low riboflavin, vitamin B2. Number eight. Purple or red palms? Liver. liver. Cool, so the, there's probably some element of their uh, liver not functioning as well as it could do. If they bruise easily, apart from Daz. Low iron. Low iron's one, yep, good, what else? Nope, but good try. So let's think about our skin. Our skin, it requires collagen. How do we support collagen? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we could do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's low GHRP6. No. <laughs> okay, you need vitamin C for collagen, okay? So if you're low in vitamin C, you're more likely to bruise easily. What do we need for blood clotting? Vitamin K. If you're low in vitamin K, you could bruise more easily. Women tend to, if I'm stereotyping here, women tend to acquire bruises easier than males, right? Why? Low iron, how come? Menstrual cycle, they bleed, they lose iron. Dry skin. Dehydration, good, what else? Yep. 
Yeah, possibly the Eastern. Good, I've not even put that one on there, but yeah. Low fats. They could have a low intake of fats. They could have a low levels of essential fatty acids. If their skin is tender to apply pressure, Yeah, it could actually be inflammation. It could be low vitamin D. It could be low magnesium. And if they have tenderness across the IT band, the outside of their thigh, on both sides, and it's not related to trauma, that could be issues with the colon, the large intestine. Last but not least, a diagonal crease on the earlobe. So there'd be an earlobe here. Okay, this is a tough one, so I'm not expecting you to guess it. And it's found in older age individuals, and this can correlate to an increase of beta amyloid protein. So beta amyloid protein is a kind of like a plaque in the brain, which promotes neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and this sort of thing. And you accumulate it when you don't sleep well, because when you sleep, the body stimulates the glymphatic system. The glymphatic system is part of the brain and how it removes a lot of cellular waste. So therefore, if someone has poor sleep, or if they're aging, or if there's a lot of neurodegenerasis, that's what that can correlate to. So that's all good, knowing all this shit, but what does that actually mean for your clients, right? Because if Susan, was it, has purple palms, you go, oh, you've got liver issues. What the fuck does that mean, right? You know? So it has to be relative. We have to relate it back. And let's work through it again. So number one, any skin conditions? Well, if they've got skin conditions, we now know that's possible issues with their gut health. Well, what do we need their gut for? We need it to digest and assimilate nutrients. We produce around 66% of our chemical brain messengers, our neurotransmitters there. We produce 75% of our immune system. So if someone has poor gut issues, they're more likely to have allergies, AKA hay fever, yeah? Red tone to the skin, could be high blood pressure. Could be systemic inflammation. Okay, so if they've got high blood pressure, well, obviously that's gonna come accompanied with the increased risk of cardiovascular disease, androgenesis, atherosclerosis, and metabolic syndrome. As for the liver, well, what does the liver do? You tell me. That was just like the, 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 the. It helps, yeah, so a good word to use is biotransformation. Because a lot of people just switch off when you say detox. They think, fuck that, it's another celery-reduced diet, right? But the technical term is biotransformation. So it just, it just helps, it just breaks down that social barrier, what some people have developed now from social media and the misrepresentation of the word detox. So yeah, it's essential for biotransformation. That doesn't just mean the elimination of external toxins, but also internal toxins like endotoxemia, like lipopolysaccharides, what we can acquire from poor gut health. It also means the appropriate conversion and management of our estrogen. So if someone's got liver issues and they're a female, they're more likely to have PMS. If we have poor liver health, what else does the, the liver do? In terms of hypertrophy, the liver will secrete thyroid binding globulin. What does that do? That binds onto the thyroid and renders a lot of the active hormones inactive. What does the thyroid do? It's essential for your metabolism. Pretty sure most clients want to have a healthy metabolism. It can also increase sex hormone binding globulin. That'll render onto your sex hormones and make them inactive too, just from having a shitty liver. And we could tell that from yellow to orange tinge of the skin, yellow spots under the eyes, if they have purple or red palms. So now you can see how it's relative. Yep. How old is she? Year 25. 25, okay. Um, she just done a comp? No. Eating disorders? No, I didn't, as I said, I didn't, she's not one of my clients. She's okay. not someone, she just literally come up to me the other night. So it was kind of like, I was like, I can't really give you any answers right now because it's not something I'm really comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, she's also gone to a doctor and they just tried to give her, they said, yeah, what we can do Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, like, and, and again, like the only reason I'm bringing this up is because it's what you just said. Yeah. Right? So it's like, if someone comes to you in that, is that what you're looking for? 
Like in regards to what section on here? What or? you just went through, so you kind of mentioned the um, yellow spots under the eyes, these kind of things in relation to the thyroid. The liver. The liver, sorry. Yep. Is, yeah, sorry, the liver, right? So you, said, you mentioned the liver. Like, is that something that you would kind of, what do you do in that situation? Do you look for these? For estrogen, yeah. completely different. I mean, for estrogen, pff, that's a whole two day seminar. <laughs> you know, so it's like we've got the first, we've got E1, E2, E3, estrone, estradiol, estriol, and we've got the metabolites, the 2 hydroxy, 4 hydroxy, 16 alpha hydroxy. And then we need to look at that specifically. And then we have to look, okay, what did the test for on the blood test? Was it estradiol? Was it E2? Because it may not be E1 or E3, and then it might be insufficient metabolism, even if it was good. You know, so blood test for testing estrogen is shit. Yeah, that's what you want, I'm yeah, it, so. you want to do a Dutch panel. Yeah, yeah you know? Yeah, but you need to do a Dutch, essentially, you know, not for, for hormone assessments, Dutch, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, but I'd start with that. If, she, if she's clinically got issues with her hormones, then, uh, you know, and if, and if you don't feel qualified or experienced to deal with it, then obviously refer out, but then, police, yeah, yeah, but so a Dutch panel would be, yeah, yeah. yeah. she kind of said she has no sex drive, all this stuff, so, yeah. she just kind of went out, it's not much of it. Yeah. There can be many, many, many different factors, you know. So stress would probably be the first thing what I'd look to assess. And when we talk about stress, stress is an ambiguous term which encompasses anything which challenges the homeostasis of the body. So that doesn't just mean psycho-emotional stress. And in psycho-emotional stress, that means perfectionism, insecurities, distrust, heartbreak, lack of support, lack of interaction. They're all psycho-emotional stresses. We have physiological stresses, physical, dietary, and then lifestyle stresses. These are all stresses, okay? So there's many different things to look down the route of, you know? But it's too much of a vague question to give a, without knowing any, you know, you'd have yeah. to assess, you know? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, the B5, um, that's a nice indeficiency. That's quite rare though. You know, you won't, won't really see that. Maybe in the older age. Now number six, brown, red tint on shins. Okay, if that's insulin resistance, well, what does insulin do? It's the main hormone in the body for storage. And, it's, and it can be fucking amazing for improving body composition because it's the only hormone which is both anabolic and anti-catabolic. So it helps you put on muscle and stops you losing muscle at the same time. But you need that to be working in your favor. Now, if it's not working in your favor, it's gonna make a lot of these other processes more challenging and harder. Bruising easily. Okay, so that could be an indication to low vitamin C. If they have low vitamin C, that could also mean they have an impaired immune system. So they're more likely to feel down and ill. Dry skin. Well, if they're having dry skin, we talked about dehydration, stress, or low fats. So that's going to give you direction onto what to do with the nutrition plan. If their skin is tender to touch, okay, could be magnesium or vitamin D. So, What's magnesium used for? 350 different biochemical reactions inside the body. Helps us break down our stress chemicals, helps us convert estrogen in the most preferential form. It helps us with bone density. Okay, so what about vitamin D? Well, vitamin D is essential for managing inflammation. It's essential for our fast twitch fibers, actually. And also bone density. And then last but not least, okay, we can mitigate the risk factor of Alzheimer's, neurodegeneration, Parkinson's by basically optimizing sleep. So that is, they're all the answers. But if you've been taking notes, you'll have them all written down. If not, take a photo. The thyroid function would also give an insight into the, uh, the bruising as well. <coughs> so, Obviously, it's all good and well, me jumping up here and telling you all this stuff, but let's kind of put a little bit of validation behind these words. So here you can see the diagonal crease behind the earlobe here, and the correlation to the beta amyloid protein in the brain, and some research studies. So you can see the stuff isn't just airy-fairy, hocus-pocus, hippie shit. Jaundice. So you can see the skin is yellow, right? This correlates to issues either with the liver, gallstones, and other factors. So if someone does have yellow eyes, or yellow skin, they've got issues with the liver, what would, what would we do? Yeah, good, 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 good. In terms of the nutrition, how could we support that? <coughs> well, 
well, make sure we eliminate a lot of the, the stuff, you know, they might be going out getting fucked up at the weekend, right, okay? So probably advising them not to have so much of a good time. You, we could also look at, uh, you know, hydration. That's paramount for the liver because it's how we can eliminate a lot of the stuff. These are just the basics. But then on top of that, we have dandelion tea, artichoke tea. We have the choleretics and cholagogues, which are two classifications of food which support the production or release of bile, which actually helps to repair the liver too. And they could be beetroot, artichoke, uh, chicory, radish, those sort of things. Any bitter flavored foods will help stimulate the liver and also help stimulate bile. And bile helps to repair the liver. It also helps to break down fats. So now we can think, right, if they've got issues with the gallstone, issues with gallstones, what does the gallbladder do? Well, it stores bile. So if they've got gallstones, it means there's probably an issue with bile. If there's an issue with bile, what else does bile do? Helps us break down fats. So now we could think, right, they may have an issue with bile, so I'm not going to put them on a keto diet, because that wouldn't really be the best thing for them in this time. Cool. Right. We'll go through nails and then I'll go back and I'll test you on skin. Vertical ridges in the nails. Okay, so we already spoke about this at the start. This can correlate to low HCL or low zinc. Brittle nails and splitting at the end. It could be low HCL, stomach acid, low zinc, low B12. Soft and weak nails. What could this be? Low protein in the diet, low calories, it could be low thyroid. If the nails curve backwards, this could be the liver. If the nails curve over, like this, there we go. If the nails curve over, this is the lung, okay? Largely the lung, it can also correlate to the heart. If they bite the nails, come on, this one's an easy one. Someone who's not spoken yet, this is, a, this is a stress. There you go, good, yes, stress. Hang nails. These are the little annoying things where you can get at the side of your nail, which is fucking getting in the way and sometimes hurt a little bit if anyone gets them. Does anyone get them? Put your hands up. Just me, just two, three, four. Right, we'll get more confidence. Six, cool. Right, so this could be low B12 or low B9. If the nail's pale, what could this mean? Iron, good. Pale base and dark towards the end of the nail. This one's a tough one, so I'm going to give it to you. It could be kidney dysfunction. Thick transverse lines which disappear under pressure. That's arsenic. Exposure generally, you know, it'd be more if someone's been working in mines, you know, but you can get arsenic from eating a, a classified fuck ton of rice but no one's going to really consume that much. White spots on the nail, it could be zinc deficiency. Cool, so again, let's make this relatable. <coughs> Why do we need stomach acid? It's all good and well going, right, Susan, your stomach acid shit, okay? But what does that mean to her? So what would the symptoms of low stomach acid be? Poor digestibility. Poor digestion, which could represent itself in? Bloating. Bloating, perfect, and that would be discomfort, upper abdominal bloating, bad breath, loose stools, undigested food in the stools. What do we need HCL for? Break down the digestion. Perfect. Break down the food. And why do we eat food? Get it to get nutrients. Macronutrients or micronutrients, right? Penultimately, right? That's what we do. So we need to break it down to in order to get our nutrients from food, and that's dependent on our <coughs> digestive capacity, and HCL being one of many integral factors there. We also need HCL to enable us to break down and assimilate zinc. What does zinc do? Digestive enzymes, testosterone. testosterone. It helps to produce luteinizing hormone, which goes to the Leydig cells to aid with the release of testosterone. It's also essential for the immune system. As Rodan said at the start, the immune system is essential for hypertrophy because of all the different complex signaling of all the cells. So if we're zinc deficient, our immune system is probably dysfunctional and our optimization of hypertrophy, along with the low protein intake and digestibility, along with the issues with testosterone, that's going to impact someone's hypertrophy. So guys, that's going to be pretty fucking relevant if you've got someone who's wanting to build muscle. Brittle and splitting at the end, this could be low B12. What's B12 for? Meat. 
Not so much. I need. <coughs> energy. Good. Helps us with energy. And it helps us with methylation. Okay, methylation is this big fancy word. Basically, it's got a lot of fucking things it can do, right? Helps us with biotransformation. Helps us with correct estrogen conversions. Helps us breaking down stress chemicals. Helps us with the production of CoQ10, which helps with our mitochondria, which produces energy. Helps us with carnitine, which supports our thyroid, which helps us with energy regulation. It also helps us with creatine. Helps us with the construction of cellular membranes. So if we know that someone's got brittle splitting nails, all those factors may possibly be impaired. So let's look at B12. Where can we obtain B12? Pardon? Yeah, what foods? Pardon? Organ meats and fish. But more, more so, you know, we've got like um, clams, they're good, crabs good. Yeah. Fish, fish is good. Really good for B12, really good. So what food kind of uh, nutrition label would someone be deficient in B12? Vegans. <laughs> Soft and weak nails, okay, so this could be low thyroid. Obviously, we know the thyroid is essential for our metabolism. It's essential for our regulation of our sex hormones. It's essential for our motility, our digestive function. So if someone's got constipation, that could also be a thyroid issue, right? Nail curves backwards, that could be liver issue. We've already spoke about liver. Nail curves over, that could be lungs. Habit of biting nails, that could be stress. So you could look at the nails and if you bite your nails like me, it shows that there's a lot of stress, but I don't get psycho-emotionally stressed, I just have stressors, okay? And how could you combat that? What could you do with someone's nutrition? Well, what happens when you're stressed? Do you have a bad day at work? What do you want to do? Eat sugar. Eat shit, you know? Eat carbs, right? Highly palatable food. So, basically our body has these signals, but it gets miscommunicated. We intrinsically know, but our environment doesn't allow it. So we crave carbohydrates when we're stressed because when we consume carbs, insulin goes up and inversely that drops some of the stress chemicals such as cortisol and other factors. So what can we do if someone has a high level of stress in their diet? You, it may increase their adherence and enjoyment of a diet if you help them lower their stress, inevitably. So if you give them slightly more carbohydrates in relation to other macronutrients as opposed to what you were going to do, it may help you manage their stress. You could do other things like look at improving their sleep, you could get them drinking chamomile tea, tussly tea, you could get them make sure the magnesium is sufficient because that's essential in breaking down the stress chemicals. You could look at their recoverability, you could get them doing some guided relaxation, download headspace, download oak, do meditation. You know there's many different things. You want to work in as well as you work out because working in is the recoverability. And that's making, that makes working out actually work. Um, where do we get to? Da, 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 da. Hangnails. So this could be low B9, again methylation. B9 folate is essential for anyone who's pregnant because it helps uh, reduce homocysteine. And if homocysteine is high, it can create, um, it can lead to preeclampsia, so basically a clogging of the fallopian tubes when they're developing a baby and basically the baby can starve and therefore it can, they can have a miscarriage. This is why folate's so good. <coughs> What's iron for? Because that's number eight, right? If we have pale nails, it could be low iron. What are the symptoms of low iron? Let's work it backwards, reverse engineer this shit. Low energy. Low energy, so good. The iron's essential for mitochondria and energy. Kidneys, that's biotransformation, detoxification. Arsenic, that's just a heavy metal which is going to lead to possible disease within the body. And then white spots is also zinc again. Okay. Right. Someone give me one thing what they could look for on the skin. Redness. Redness of the skin. Okay, someone else tell me what that possibly means. High blood pressure. High blood pressure or systemic inflammation. Perfect. Right, another possible thing to look on the skin. Great. Yes, what does that mean? And what? Perfect. Good. And what could we do? Obviously, we want to refer out if it's like pretty bad, but we'd moderate the fat intake, we'd support them with hydration, use beetroot maybe, dandelion tea, artichoke tea, uh, radish, chicory, this sort of thing. 
One last one for the skin. Yeah, perfect, yep. And what could that be? Low vitamin A Perfect. As well as low EFAs or riboflavin and vitamin B2. So there's many different things there. But largely, it would give you insight into their digestibility and ability to assimilate nutrients, which comes from the gut, which is why the outer skin is a reflection to the inner skin's health. Okay? This one, one sec. Oh, you're on about the bottom of the nails. That, that, yeah, I, I genuinely, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll, if I remember at the end of this to research it, I will, right? Cool. And there the answer is what we just spoke about. But it's good if you write this down because you're going to enhance your uptake of it because you're not reliant on just a lazy photo. You know? You're actually putting cognition into physical practice which will allow the neural pathways to embed what you're seeing and learning. Here you go. Boom. So if you go in the Mayo Clinic, the Mayo Clinic is probably um, one of the most renowned clinics that have a lot of data on there, but you know, it's referenced throughout literature and it correlates to lung, um, it does have a, a, a correlation to lung cancers, but that's, don't go around saying that shit, yeah? <laughs> you know? uh, but also CVD, but I mean, here we can see the whole list of conditions. We've got cardiovascular diseases here, and we've got lung issues. But the, the, man, the actual manifestation of how it occurs is here, and we can grade it. And then here are some other possibilities, and this is an example of the nails being pale at the bottom, and then going darker towards the end, which correlates to kidneys, which is again re referenced in clinical literature. Cool. Right. Assess your partners. Tell me if they have anything wrong with their nails. 30 seconds. Go. Ten seconds. Right. So, put your hands up if your partner had anything wrong with their nails. Wrong's the, the wrong word to use. Any, yeah. Any any feedback from their nails? Put your hands up. Okay. So keep them up high. Okay. So that's like everyone in the room. Okay. We're health coaches. Imagine your client, yeah? There's gonna be having a lot more telltale signs as opposed to us. Because chances are, we eat healthy. Hopefully we should, and we live a healthy lifestyle, hopefully. So, you know, there's already a lot we can gain. Right, eyes. Dark circles under the eyes, what does that mean? Exactly, so if you're tired, what does that mean? What is, this, uh, what is a lack of energy regulation correlated to? Stress, good. So you may not have had poor sleep to be tired. It could be that you have a high level of stress. It could also correlate to toxic burden. Puffy eyes upon wakening. An example of this, if anyone goes out and has something what they may be intolerant to, let's say possibly a pizza, if someone is sensitive to lactose or gluten, and they wake up the next day, the eyes Maybe puffy and red. Does anyone, can anyone resonate with that? I can myself, yeah, cool, some people. Right, so this would be maybe a food, in, food intolerance. But if it's chronically red, it could be potentially parasites. Dry eyes. Been having the hair dryer in your eye too long. No. Dehydration. Mm, it, it won't really be too much in the eyes being dry. It's more zinc or choline. Pale flesh behind the eyelid, we have already had this, so let's see if you were listening. Low iron. Low iron, good. Cataracts. 
insulin resistance, low vitamin A or low vitamin E. Floaters on the eyes. Everyone says what are floaters. So who's seen Family Guy? I didn't even know this until I did th this seminar in Malaysia and someone says, oh, have you seen Family Guy? And then we had to get it up in it. Fucking Stewie's done a fucking song about having floaters on his eyes. So check it out later on, right? So um, basically these floaters, this could be low inositol or low choline. The pupil response test. So I want you to partner up again. You have partner A and partner B. Partner A will close their eyes for 10 seconds whilst facing partner B, okay? And then when they open their eyes, I want you to look into their pupils to see if there's been a delay in the pupils from going small to big or vice versa, okay? So turn around, close your eyes, 10 seconds, 10, nine, eight, if there's a delay, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now look at the pupils, is there a delay? So that's a lot. Close your eyes. 10 seconds, 10. No, nothing. 8, 7, 6. If you want to come around, have a look. Keep them close. Right, and then open your eyes. Now he's all right. Yeah, he's sweet. So yeah, you're cool. So sometimes there could be a slight delay. It'd be minute. It'd be like a millisecond, right? But if, that, if you open the eyes, it doesn't change. That's, that's good. Right, swap over the partners. Close your eyes. Assess. If it doesn't change. If it doesn't change, it's sweet. But your, lymphatic, your lymphatic system's not too good. That's something else. But from, we'll get onto that one. Right. Did anyone's eyes respond slowly? A slight delay? Or did they stay the same? Some, how many people? Oh, yeah, one, two, three. Okay, four. Yeah. Five. <laughs> yeah, okay. So this could correlate to high stress. Um, it's hard to put it into that bracket, you know? Hard to put it into that bracket. Um, so yeah, stress. Yes. Yeah. Lymphatic rosary is that. So have a look at your partner's eyes. Usually people go, oh, you've got beautiful eyes. But I turn around and go, oh, your lymphatic system shit. Right? So it starts around the eyes. Yeah, you got sli slightly, yeah? It's not, like, it's not that dramatic, is it? It's Look at like, this one. Yeah, I can tell. Can you see it? Yeah, it's yeah? interesting. I need to wear glasses, so I shouldn't have been able to see it from where I saw it. Cool. Has anyone got this pretty little pattern of fucked upness? Yeah? Like, I have a little bit. Yeah? Yeah. The, it's, the, it's the white sh shit going on. It'll be a lighter colour, yeah? The eye colour will uh, give you an insight into the genes. Generally, blue eyes will have a comped polymorphism, which stops them from breaking down stimulants as effectively. They're more susceptible to stress and usually have a worse conversion of estrogen. Right, so, yeah, generally, you know. Uh, because the comp blue eye, everything's... DNA expressions, right? Okay, DNA and shit like that. So if we have blue eyes, generally people with blue eyes may be more sensitive to coffee, or they may have just taxed coffee a fucking load and then they desensitize themselves to it. So, um, where do we get to? Pulsating pupils, this will be stress again. Nerve rings is basically a ring around the um, pupil, which will be stress. And a twitching eye, a mad scientist thing going on. What's, if your eye twitches, what does that correlate into? Magnesium. Perfect, yes, magnesium. Good. It could be stress, but stress increases the stress chemicals, and then you break down those stress chemicals through catecholamine methyltransferase, which is magnesium uh, dependent. So therefore, when you have more stress, you're probably going to tank your magnesium. So it's one or the other, maybe. Who knows? Answers. They're all the answers, what we just spoke through. So... But you'll get to a stage where you can literally like, I'm not looking at these answers, and I'm able to go, duh, 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 this means that, this means that, this means that. You'd expect me to do so, but it's not that hard to get there, okay? 
So you'd be able to do this instantly by looking at someone and pick out three things and you could tell them about it. So it's a really good tool for you to build that rapport. As for the magnesium deficiency, these are a list of possible symptoms of deficiency. But here we can see twitching of facial muscles. We have uh, cramps as well. Cramping in the calf is a, is a big one. Right, nose. If someone has a chronic stuffy nose. Good. Yep, so food intolerance is one. Let's, let's, let's look at that, okay? So the food intolerances is a response from the immune system, okay? Just a quick immune 101 lesson. We have two main sides of the immune system, okay? Th1 and Th2, okay? Th1 is more cell mediated, it's aggressive, and it basically engulfs or poisons gram negative bacteria. Okay, so that means any small stuff which it can easily destroy and get rid of, it will do so. But then we have this side, which is TH2, and that's gram positive bacteria. So anything which is bigger than a gram, right? Parasites, guts, gut like uh, gut bacteria, um, allergens, that's bigger than a gram. Pollen, that's bigger than a gram. So we, we don't have the ability to engulf it or destroy it. So we have to flush it from our body. And that's either with diarrhea, mucosal production, so discharge from the eyes, the nose, vomiting, that sort of reaction. Okay, so if it's too big to poison or engulf, we have to flush it out. And that's part of the TH2 response. So now when we understand that, we can think, right, it's not just food intolerances, but it could also be mold. It could also be allergens as well, like hay fever. Small red veins visible on the nose and on the cheeks. Yep, low HCL, could be low B12 or B9. And generally, you tend to see it in alcoholics, right? You go to the pub, there's that old guy in the corner smashing down the pints. You can see all the veins on the nose. Loss of smell. This is largely related to zinc. But then you've got the erroneous variables of, you know, if you've got a client who's a boxer, he's done a lot of MMI, uh, MMA, He's got punched in the nose a few fucking times, and then probably is gonna not have a good nose, you know. And then hair growing out of the, uh, the nose for males. What what demographic would we see this in? Older age. Perfect. So what does the older age male have differently to the younger age male? Low testosterone. Cool. They're the answers. So tell me something what you could assess with the eyes. It's like a fucking hybrid. Dark circles, cool. What does that mean? Stress good, right? Okay, someone from this side again. What else can you look at in the eyes? The white shit, lymphatic rosary, yeah? Okay, what does that mean? What could that correlate to? We didn't really touch on that, did we? So what's the lymphatic system? Yeah, so, oh, yeah right, okay. So the drainage of toxins, but also what else? Which, yeah, good. So if you have high inflammation, your body will remove a lot of these, these, these kind of inflammatory molecules and toxins through the lymphatic system. What else? No, so, so with, the, with the lymphatic system. Oh, yeah, no worries. Eager beaver there. Circulate. Well, it, it would also correlate to circulation, but we need the lymphatic system to deliver our fat soluble vitamins around. We also need it for the delivery of some hormones. How does the lymphatic system work? Well, it doesn't have a series of valves, so it requires movement. Your clients probably are going to be general pop, right? So that means most likely, <laughs> They're going to be working a nine to five job where they're sat down. That's not moving, that's staying still. So what happens, they can accumulate a lot of lymphatic tissue where the gravity is, hence the lower back and other lower back issues. So it could be a biomechanical reason why they have lower back pain from issues with the hip flexors, glutes, you fucking name it. But it could also be a physiological aspect involved from the accumulation of the lymphatic shit 
what they're, they're holding down there. Okay? So we could improve the lymphatic system by running, jogging, impact. What happens when we do bodybuilding? It's the opposite, right? It's constriction. You're squeezing the fucking muscle. You're trapping all that shit in there. So therefore, the lymphatic system will generally be worse <laughs> with bodybuilders. Like if you feel your glands here, you may be able to feel them. You know, that shouldn't really be like that. Cool. One more thing for the eyes. What can we look at on the eyes? Cataracts. Pardon? Cataracts. Cataracts, good. And what could that give us insight into? Insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, good. What else? Two vitamins, fat soluble vitamins. That narrows it down to four. B12? A. No, A and E, bingo, well done, good. <laughs> yeah. Right, the mouth, okay. So if someone has cracked and scaling lips. What's this, sorry? Zinc. Zinc. More so, actually, uh, B vitamins. It's largely correlated to B vitamins, you know, but it, it, zinc could be a factor. Um, someone has cold sores. What, what could that be? Pardon? Yeah, so, so basically there's an imbalance between lysine and arginine. So they probably have too much arginine in relation to the lysine. So where do you get arginine? You get arginine from pea protein, you get it from dark chocolate, you get it in nuts. But you can mitigate that slightly with increase in lysine, but then, you know, supporting that you could use astragalus. But really, you want to look at the allostatic load, and if someone's got a lot of heavy metals, it'll tend to come out more. Weak gums. Yes, good. Vitamin K2. Vitamin K2. Where do we get vitamin K? Pardon? Um, yep, we, we also produce it. We produce a lot of vitamin uh, K within our gut. So with our microbiome, when it's healthy, diverse, sufficient, we can produce lots of vitamin K. We get it from organ meats as well. The weak gums could also be a correlation to low vitamin C. Tooth decay. Lack of brushing. brushing yet. Yeah. It could be obviously high sugar, but it can also give you insight into H. pylori or candida because they can actually reside within plaque on our teeth. And if you have an increased level of candida or H. pylori, it'll promote plaque and that could also induce more tooth decay because the mouth is still the first part of the gastrointestinal tract. You have your mouth, you throw it all the way through to your intestines. So we have to pay attention to the oral microbiome as well. And then if you grind your teeth, this could be high stress, it could be low GABA, yes, and it could also be parasites if you grind your teeth at night time because the parasites can be active while she's asleep and that could be a stress on the body. It could be low CoQ10 for the, the weak gums as well. So this is an example of the cracked lips. Bingo, yep, zinc in there. <clears throat> cool. Tongue, so turn around to your partner. Stick out your tongue. Don't be shy, show them the war face. Yeah. All right, you haven't got a partner, stick out your tongue. Yeah. Right, okay, food intolerances. So you've got grooves on the side of your tongue. Yeah. Yeah, you're moving. Issues with his gut. So he's got mucosal film in the central geographical crack. Oh, yeah. interesting. But you can see how it's just quivering a little bit, like yeah. doing some salsa shit going on. <laughs> right, swap partners, stick out your tongue. Cool, right. So the first one, 
yellow cast to the tongue. We have to first ask them if they've recently drank coffee, which looks like the fucking vast majority of, of us have, right, okay? So let's avoid that one. That would mean issues with liver, perfect. Yellow usually means the liver, okay? If someone sticks out the tongue and is doing some little fucking wobbling thing going on, like a little micro dance, what could that mean? Not got issues, stress. The gut issues was a central geographical crack. Okay. Stress means you probably have an inability to relax. So therefore, an inability to relax the tongue and the tongue's fucking getting all excited. Mucosal film. Gut. Why? What does the mucosal <coughs> film or barrier or production do? Button. The, what's that? Sorry? No, good, but thank you for trying. It's, it's a protective barrier. So if we have foods, what we're intolerant to, or pathogens within our gut, which we don't really want there, the body will ramp up the mucosal production as a protective barrier, but also to help you flush out. Think of hay fever. Your body doesn't want that allergens inside, so it increases the mucosa. So a mucosal film, which is a white film on the tongue, could be indicative of some kind of imbalance within the gut. Right, stick out the tongue to turn around to your partner. See if they have grooves on the side of the tongue. A lot of the time people go, no, I've not. You go closer, yeah, they do, right? It'd be the small little indents here. Basically, what this is, is the tongue swelling inside of their mouth and pressing against their teeth. It's not like the bone with a big tongue, right? It's it's pressing inside their teeth and there will be the grooves of their teeth on the side of the tongue. So that can correlate to food intolerances. Because if you're allergic to food, you have an allergic reaction, you go puffy and inflamed. If you're intolerant, it's a lesser scale of it. And what happens, you put that food directly onto your tongue and then it swells a little bit and then you can get the grooves. So have a look, see if the partner's got it. If anyone says they haven't, I'll double check and we can... Yeah. Let's go. Yes, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then not so much, but yours is Candida. Candida, that one, that bottom one. Red spots on his tongue. Yeah. Stay still. No, but she's got like some red spots on the tongue though. What is that? What's that? Oh, that line. Yeah, that's your gut health. Yeah. Cool. Right, so who had little grooves in the side of the tongue? Yeah, sweet. Red spots on the tongue, so stick out the tongue again. Any red spots? Yeah, you have. So this can correlate to candida. So if someone has red spots on the tongue, candida can also be an influencing factor for someone to have UTIs. Red spots, candida, candida more likely to have UTIs. If they stick out the tongue and the tongue's wobbling, it could also be hyperactivity of the thyroid. So this is an example. Here we can see the glossitis of the this can correlate to issues with the gut. So this, see this geographical crack here? This can be gut-related issues which could also stem to their stomach. What does the stomach do? It produces HCL, but it also produces <coughs> intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is essential to allow the body to absorb B12. Hence this. Cool. Right, what did we do before? Tongue, mouth. Right, what are some things we can look at on the mouth to gain insight? Not, not the mouth, yeah. Uh, uh, cold sore. Pardon? Cold sore. cold sore. What can we do if someone's got cold sores? It, that's part of the herpes simplex virus. There's seven different forms of that. It's HSV1. What can we do? Look at their arginine to lysine ratio, give them more lysine, reduce arginine, <coughs> reduce stress, support them with astragalus, look at the toxic load. What's some, something else we could do when we look at the mouth? Okay, cool. Brilliant. What does that mean? 
low vitamin C or low vitamin K or low CoQ10. One last one for the mouth. Okay. Tooth decay, cool. What could that correlate into? Candida, 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 uh, H. pleuri, or not brushing your teeth. Yeah. Cool. Right. With the tongue, what can we look at on the tongue? Yellow tinge. What could that correlate to? Liver or good coffee. Right. What else can we look on the tongue? Quivering. Good. And what could that correlate to? Stress. Brilliant. One last thing on the tongue. Spots. And what could that correlate to? Candida. Perfect. Right, so hair. If the hair's thinning, what could this be? Pardon? That's this. Um, ba, 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 ba. Number two, male pattern baldness. So I've, I've got that one in there. Thinning could be, pardon? Well, so zinc and biotin will support hair uh, development, but the factors which will largely lead to hair loss, the bigger factors, would be low thyroid. Yeah? That's a bigger factor. If you're low zinc, you're not really, your hair's not going to suddenly start falling out per se. Uh, it's a, a bigger influencing factor. What I'd look to assess and gain further insight on would be the thyroid. It could also be um, fungus, fungus related. You know, alopecia could be mediated from fungus. But that, I mean, zinc, biotin, they can still definitely play an integral role. It could also mean what happens when we're dieting down? Lack of nutrients, lack of, lack of calories. So the hair quality that may be, may be suffering from eating disorders. And that can also lead to hair loss too. Male pattern baldness, we had that. that is elevated dihydrotestosterone. So you get testosterone, it goes down the 5-alpha reductase pathway, it converts to dihydrotestosterone. So if someone does suffer from male pattern baldness, you could give them sol palmetto. Sol palmetto will reduce the activity of the 5-alpha reductase pathway, which would reduce the likelihood of them having further uh, male pattern baldness. Male pattern baldness is definitely um, D DHT, but the iron deficiency may be thinning. But in terms of male pattern baldness, where it goes bald here, that's definitely DHT, yeah. yeah. Um, and if someone is suffering from male pattern baldness and they get given the medication Finistride, that's got a lot of negative implications associated to it. There's a lot of research into post-sexual dysfunction when someone takes Finistride. So that's something to be aware of. So if you do have a client, they've got male pattern baldness, they've gone to the doctor, they've taken Finistride to stop, the, stop them from going bald, they may be suffering from a low libido, erectile dysfunction, and all these, all these other factors. Dull and flat hair. Low protein, low calories, low thyroid. Dandruff. Correlates to the gut health, you know, largely it correlates to possible fungus. Painful hair when brushing. Low vitamin D, perfect. So vitamin D is essential for the structural connective tissue support. Where is your structural connective tissue most compromised? Your hair, it's thinnest. So when you brush your hair, it hurts. Possible, low vitamin D. You could also check, check the um, density of the tibia by pressing it. Premature graying, stress, or low antioxidants. Abnormal hair growth for females. So hirtuism. Pardon? Yes, which largely, you know, uh, individuals which suffer from PCOS, that's a big one there. So what they could actually do is look to reduce their, their um, testosterone, reduce the DHT, and increase sex hormone binding globulin. So you could use peppermints, for instance, which can increase sex hormone binding globulin, reduce the protein intake, reduce the intake of red meat. Losing the outer third of their eyebrow. Perfect, thyroid, good. They're the answers, but you've written down. Cool. So you can see
see here, loss of lateral third of eyebrows for the thyroid. Cool, brilliant. We'll just brief, just skim over these dead fast just to give you insight into a couple of topics before we break up for lunch. So we'll skip over this. <coughs> so when we stuck out the tongue, individuals which had either spots or cracks in specific areas, that can correlate to, say for instance, if it was central, geographical cracks, that could be the stomach. If they have red spots, for instance, at the back of the tongue, that could correlate to the kidneys. A, a spot at the tip of the tongue could be the heart. So we can use other factors to gain insight. Cool. And then we've got meridian lines, which is a, a, a very good um, traditional Chinese medicine tool. So if someone suffers from um, a lot of pain in the right shoulder, and it's not specifically from any trauma, and they've tried going to osteopath, um, chiropractors and um, fucking physiotherapists, and it's not really getting redemption, possibly look and assess their gallbladder function, their liver function, and gain, gain any correlations to their meridian line. Because when you alleviate and support the gallbladder function, sometimes you can actually really fucking improve their shoulder issues. Now, there's three reasons why that could happen. It could be a placebo. It could actually be the meridian line, number two. Or number three, it could be that you're actually supporting their fat digestion, which was possibly impaired before, so they have a better intake and assimilation of their central fatty acids so they can regulate inflammation and allow recovery of their injury. So there's many different possibilities there. Cool. Bro. Right. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> no, the Chapman's reflex points is where you can press uh, specific areas in the body to gain insight into a possible dysfunction. So you could assess the stomach peristalsis or stomach acidity. Uh, you could look at uh, their lung function. You can, you know, it's, it's kind of mirroring aspects of acupressure and meridian lines, but it's a whole concept named and developed from uh, Chapman. So, yeah. So us as like health and fitness professionals, obviously, mm -hmm. so these markers are something that we kind of look at if we're seeing no improvement and there's Still deterioration or no improvement of health, we can kind of look at these markers. And, and I'd look at these markers anyway. Well, even if we're just we're mastering the basics, we're doing what we can, mm -hmm. what our scope allows. Yeah. We can see these and then say, okay, so you know, need to go see this person, this person. Yeah, you could for hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. But there's also easy things what you could do which isn't invasive, which isn't yes. jeopardizing yourself. Yes. You know, as well, yeah. which which would add a whole new dimension, yeah. but also build rapport and enable stuff what they didn't initially perceive you of doing in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I don't expect you to know all these, like fuck, if you can just walk away with three from each section, like we did, then that's gonna be quite profound in terms of your ability to potentially help at least one of your fucking clients, but chances are it's gonna be relative to the majority. Yep. Um, the best profession to refer out to? In terms of? Um, it depends what area you're in, and is are you working with clients online? Um, and well, if it's if it's if it's not, let's say hair, skin, and nails, right? Okay, they've got vertical ridges in the nails. That's not personally a referable thing to be like, oh shit, let's go get your nails sorted out. Yeah, so they'd be more like the the the. Jaundice, for instance, the yellowing of the skin, the the um, the kidneys, they are they are very worth referring out, and yeah, and anyone, it'd be biased me saying refer to me and uh, gaining all your clients. Uh, basically, anyone who is a trusted functional medicine practitioner, who is qualified and experienced, and you have a rapport with, and you feel confident that they're gonna support you and your client, refer to them.